Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2. What we're going to do this morning is we, of course, understand that there was particular information that Scripture calls the mystery that was given to the Apostle Paul. And so we're going to spend some time understanding in detail what is the mystery. And in fact, what we'll see is there is more than one mystery that was committed to Paul. And so we want to just understand the different aspects of those mysteries. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Notice, even the hidden wisdom. Whenever Scripture does that, when it will say a term, typically a noun, and then it will say even the such and such, it's giving you a definition. It, it's telling you that when you see the word mystery, here's what you should understand it to mean. So a mystery, based upon 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7, is hidden wisdom. So it's wisdom... But what particular kind? It's wisdom that has been hidden or concealed. It's not obvious. It's, it's, there's something about it where it's not entirely straightforward. So notice the rest of verse 7. Which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So the mystery that's being described in 1 Corinthians 2 is something that God ordained before the world, but it wasn't revealed until later because during that time it was hidden. Look at verse 8. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The princes of this world in verse 8 is a reference to devilish principalities and powers. It's not a reference to human princes. It's a reference to Satan and his minions that have been permitted to occupy roles in God's heavenly government. So now think about verse 8 again. Which none of the princes of this world knew. They didn't know the mystery. And they didn't know the mystery because it was hidden, and therefore it was not something they could know, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So just think through this with me carefully. What does Satan do immediately prior to the cross? He enters into Judas, right? If you look at Luke 22, immediately before the Lord is betrayed, Satan enters into Judas. What that tells you is that Satan, at that point in time, immediately before the cross, was in favor of the cross. He thought that the cross served his interests. He was in favor of it. But verse 8 says, which none of the princes of this world knew, they didn't know the mystery. Had they known it, the mystery, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So that's a very profound statement. Think about what it's saying. Satan is obviously in favor of the cross. He enters into Judas to cause it to come about. Later, when he comes to understand the mystery, he changes his opinion. At that point in time, he realizes, wait a minute. Now knowing what I know, now understanding the mystery, I never would have been in favor of the cross. So the mystery is very profound information. Number one, you can tell that it was hid from Satan and his minions. They had no idea of it. And number two, 
it is so consequential that had Satan known it, he would have had an entirely different perspective on the cross. He wouldn't have been in favor of it. So with that as introduction, we're going to now look at the mysteries revealed to Paul and under, you know, let's understand these and let's evaluate them with the frame of reference that these are so significant Satan's strategy would have changed entirely were he aware of them, but he wasn't. Get with me Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 and verse 25. Romans eleven twenty-five. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Now, people joke about verses like this, and they say that that verse reveals the largest denomination within Christendom. And what is it? The ignorant brethren. Uh, and you know, the, the, the thing about that that's true, the vast majority of the body of Christ is, in fact, ignorant of the Pauline mysteries. And you know what God did? Is he hit them right in the Word of God and no one can find them. I'm being a little humorous there or trying to be, but what happens, of course, you, 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 I'm sure you've realized this, is the vast majority of the church goes on with their life in complete unawareness of what the Bible says. Right? That's, that's sort of how life on earth works. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Then notice what it says here. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. Is that a compliment? It's not. The idea of being wise in your own conceits, what does the word conceits mean? Well, it has to do with pride and arrogance and egotism, right? People that are conceited are full of themselves. What Romans 11.25 describes is someone who is wise, not in the scriptures, but in their own conceits. In other words, they think they're wise, but are they really? They're not. So let's put the whole verse together. If you are ignorant of this mystery, which we're going to define in just a second, what are you likely to be? I'm so wise. I know so much. In other words, when you're ignorant of the mystery, which we're going to look at in just a second here, you, you tend to be wise in your own conceits. In other words, you don't have true scriptural wisdom. You just have the wisdom that is really sort of the vanity of your own mind. Now, notice what the rest of verse 25 says. That, here, here's the mystery, blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So the mystery that's being referred to here is that Israel has been blinded. How much of Israel has been blinded? Just part of it, right? Not all of it, part of it. And in fact, when you read Romans 11, it specifically tells you that within Israel there was an, an election, there was a remnant according to the election of grace. So just notice this. When Scripture talks about Israel being blinded, and we, we know from, from Romans 11 that during the Acts period, Israel falls and diminishes. And I personally believe the fall and diminishing is the, that the word fall is defined as diminishing in Romans 11. But the point being, as you think about time past, Israel had a superior position to Gentiles. Everyone gets that, right? Israel was God's chosen people. But what happens in the book of Acts is Israel, because of their unbelief, falls and diminishes. Romans 11 what we're looking at here in verse 25, talks about blindness. Israel has been blinded. 
Now, we won't take the time to turn there, but can anyone remember the first public miracle that Paul did? If you can't remember it, your homework this week is to figure out what it, what it is and um, see how it's relevant to Romans 11.25. So blindness in part has happened to Israel. And then what is the next word? Until. What does the word until signify? It's not going to last forever. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. During the dispensation of grace, the fullness of the Gentiles is going to come in. And obviously, based upon Romans 11.25, the blindness that Israel experienced is going to be lifted once that occurs. This is significant for a number of reasons. I'll just focus on one. There is a teaching today that what God has done with the body of Christ is he has replaced Israel. Here's the way the teaching goes. I don't happen to agree with this, but I'm telling you the teaching so you're aware of it. What some will teach is the following. God in the Old Testament provided the prophets, and then he sent his son, and Israel rejected the son. When Israel rejected the Son and then subsequently rejected the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the early part of the book of Acts, God decided, forget you. I'm done with you. And what I'm going to do is instead I'm going to involve the Gentiles. and I'm going to form the body of Christ. What replacement theology says is that God permanently ceased his dealings with Israel, and Israel has been replaced by the body of Christ. Is that teaching sound? Well, that teaching has a lot of problems, one of the most basics of which is the fact that that means all the promises God made to Israel, he's not going to fulfill. You know, in other words, if what God did is I'm done with Israel, and the body of Christ has taken their place. What does that say about all the promises given to Abraham and other people in the Old Testament? Well, they're just not going to happen. Instead of those blessings being for Israel, those blessings would instead be for the body of Christ. On the basis of what we just read in Romans 11.25, blindness in part has happened to Israel What was the next word? Until. So is God going to ultimately accomplish with Israel everything that he said he would? Yes. What that tells you then is that replacement theology is something that is ignorant of the mystery, isn't it? And based upon Romans 11.25, when you're ignorant of the mystery, you tend to be what? Wise in your own conceits. So one more thing before we move on. What we're learning here about the mystery is that the blindness that in part that happened to Israel is time limited. It is only for a certain period of time. It will then end. And the prophetic timetable that God had prophesied in time past That in Acts 2, when Peter stands up and says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, was absolutely correct. And it was about to play out before God said, time out. We're going to do the dispensation of grace for a while. But once the dispensation of grace ends, what's the last event of the dispensation of grace? Yep, adoption, catching up, rapture, all are valid answers, well done. We're going to resume right where we left off on the prophetic calendar. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until 
the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, which is what occurs during the dispensation of grace. Look with me at Ephesians 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. So we're seeing the mystery again. As I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known. Well, that lines up with what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2.8 is exactly like Ephesians 3, verse 5. So Satan, let me read verse 5 again here, which in other ages was not made known. The fact that God had not made it known is why Satan and his minions were not going to be able to perceive it. it. It hadn't been revealed. Pause here. The way that spiritual truth works, it is necessary for God to reveal it. Can man and Satan just figure out God's thoughts because we can watch what he's doing and we can read the mind of God because we can just intuit it? No, we don't have the ability to do that. His his thinking is so far beyond ours. The way that we learn things that are spiritually true is God has to reveal them to us. Can anyone think of maybe an example of that? Right? Had God not revealed to us the scriptures, we wouldn't have any understanding. Right? That, that's the source of it. So now look at verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Verse 6. That, and here we're going to get the definition of the mystery of Christ from verse 4. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So the mystery of Christ is that the Gentiles will be fellow heirs and of the same body. Think about what we know on the timetable. In time past, when God calls out Abraham, calls him out of Ur of the Chaldees, he makes promises to Abraham as to what his descendants will inherit. Throughout the Old Testament, does Israel have a place of blessing that is superior to Gentiles? And the answer is yes, they they, they clearly do. One example that I find fascinating, when when David goes out and he's about to fight Goliath, how does he refer to Goliath? As, As an uncircumcised Philistine. Was David saying that because he was mocking Goliath's hygiene? What was the reason David said that? Well, the reason why he was saying that is what he was really saying is, here's this huge giant. And he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine to defy the armies of the living God? In other words, Goliath is huge and powerful and intimidating. And what David does, he says, well, here's what's going on. I don't care how big you are. You're on the wrong team. Isn't that essentially what he's saying? In other words, who were God's chosen people? Israel. Gentiles were not. Look with me at, you're in Ephesians, get Ephesians 2, verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in, and what does it say next? Time passed. As you think about dispensationalism, there's all sorts of different ways to divide things. But one simple way to think about things is past, present, and future, right? 
Ephesians 2, 11, in fact, uses the terminology time past. Ephesians 2, 13 uses but now. In other words, present. And, and Ephesians 2, 7 says ages to come. So there's a lot of more fine and granular distinctions we can use. But just to start for the moment here, past, present, future is not a bad one. It's pretty straightforward and we all get it. Look at verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Verse 12. That at that time, in other words, he's saying, Gentiles, guys, here's how it was in the past. At that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. I don't know why someone doesn't put that in a nice glossy picture so you can hang that on the fridge. Don't you find that inspirational? It's not very inspirational, is it? No, what, it, what, it, what it's saying is, at that time ye were without Christ. They're aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and Israel is God's channel of blessing. So if Israel is God's channel of blessing, and you're an alien from it, what does that mean? Well, you're in a bad spot, aren't you? And then notice what it says. Strangers from the covenants of promise. So there's covenants of promise that God gives to Israel... And Gentiles are not recipients of those. And then in case you missed it, having no hope. You see the problem of Gentiles in time past. That is why it's reasonable to think of it as Israel was God's chosen people. They were the commonwealth of Israel. They had received the covenants of promise. And Gentiles had not. So now go back to Ephesians 3 verse 6 that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Do you see how different that is? Would anyone back here in time past say Gentiles are fellow heirs? I mean, it says the exact opposite of that, doesn't it? So fundamentally what happens during the mystery is that Jew and Gentile are fellow heirs in the body of Christ, which is a complete difference from how everything operated in time past. Look with me at verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, when it describes the fellowship of the mystery, in my opinion, it's referring to, in verse 5, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. In other words, Jew and Gentile in, in Christ, in the body of Christ, can have fellowship today. Did they have fellowship in time past? Do you remember what happens in Acts 10 when Cornelius shows up? What was the vision that Peter had in Acts 10? Does anyone remember? Peter has a vi <laughs> Jonathan does. Tell me, Jonathan. Well done. So in Acts 10, Peter is hungry, and he would have eaten. He, he falls into a trance. He has a vision, and the vision is all manner of unclean animals. So he has a vision of all these unclean animals. And the voice says to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. Well, what should happen as an Old Testament observant Jew if you see a vision of all kind of unclean animals, and it says, go eat. What should you do? Well, your first reaction should be, what are you talking about? I've read Leviticus. There's a bunch of animals that are unclean. What do you mean, arise, Peter, kill, and eat? And it happens three times. And then Acts 10, 14, I believe, actually says, now Peter doubted in himself what the vision should mean. I mean, so think about it this way. So you're right here. Leviticus is back here. So for the past, 
how many thousand years there's clean and unclean animals. And then there's a voice that says, go ahead and eat the unclean animals. What would your reaction be? What are you, what are you talking about? That can't possibly be the case. After he has that vision, a Gentile shows up at his door. What is Peter's reaction to that? Well, it's not lawful for him to have company with a Gentile. And why did he think that? Because of everything in time past. So fundamentally what happens during the dispensation of grace is that Gentiles are fellow heirs and of the same body. They were not that in time past. They were not that in Matthew 15. And verse 9 calls it the fellowship of the mystery. That's what I think that's a reference to. So now read the rest of verse 9. Which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So that mystery was hid where? It was hid in God. Isn't that what it says? So was it hidden in the Old Testament? It wasn't hidden in the Old Testament. It was hid in God himself. Now notice there, it's from the beginning of the world. So did God invent the mystery? Did God watch how human history played out? Things got to here and he said, wow, my plan. It just nothing happened the way I thought it would. I'm so shocked. And so I'm just going to change things up. Is that what happened? Or did God always know, this is exactly what I'm going to do, but I'm not going to reveal it until this time? And, and obviously that's the case. Does God know the end from the beginning? He does. Does he have perfect knowledge of all things? He does. But he chooses when to reveal things. So what he did with the mystery, he purposed it right here. He knew exactly what he would do, but he did not reveal it until he revealed it to the Apostle Paul. And what we saw in 1 Corinthians 2 is that Satan right here, despite all of his knowledge, the Old Testament calls him wiser than Daniel. Satan had a, a deep working knowledge of the Old Testament, deep working knowledge of the Scriptures. He had all of that. But he did not have any understanding of the mystery because God had not revealed it, and Satan had no ability to figure out that which God had not revealed. So right here, he says, I'm in favor of the cross. Jesus Christ will be put to death. The Son of God will be crucified. He'll be humiliated. He'll be scourged. His beard will be ripped off. He'll be spitted on. All of these things. And Satan was, yes, I support all of that. And he supported all of that, knowing full and well that the, the, the resurrection would occur, because John 2 prophesied it. Knowing full well that the cross would purchase Israel's kingdom. But he still was in favor of the cross. But then, once the revelation of the mystery was given to Paul, Satan says what the new virgins quote him as saying is, oops, I'm kidding on that. But he realizes in the middle of the book of Acts, wait a minute, this was a colossal mistake. The colossal mistake pertains to the fact that Jew and Gentile are fellow heirs, and here's the key part, and of the same what? Body. What God is doing today during the dispensation of grace is he is forming the body of Christ, and it is the body of Christ that Satan hates. Get Ephesians 5.32. Ephesians 5.32. Ephesians 5.32, this is a great mystery, what is it? But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Some will say, there is only one church throughout the Bible. That's just not true. A church is a group of believers assembled sort of like the Avengers. Not really. But 
what God does is he has different churches at different times, right? There's a church in the wilderness with Moses. It, that's a different, the church in the wilderness with Moses that's referenced in Acts 7, that's different than the church of the body of Christ. So there are different churches at different times, but the church that was the mystery is the church where Jew and Gentile are fellow heirs in the body of Christ. That is what Ephesians 5.32 is referring to, and that is the mystery that had Satan known he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Get with me 1 Timothy 3, 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. In 1 Timothy 3.16, we're going to read of the mystery of godliness. 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. What is often said is that the mystery in 1 Timothy 3.16 is that Jesus Christ took upon himself human flesh. Because it says here, God was manifest in the flesh. Now, we won't spend a ton of time on this, but that's not what that verse is referring to. Was it a mystery? Was it hidden wisdom that God would manifest himself in the flesh? What does Isaiah 7 tell you about a virgin that shall be with child, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, right? Didn't the Old Testament prophesy that God would come in the flesh in the form of Jesus Christ? It wasn't a mystery. It wasn't hidden. It was declared beforehand. And by the way, this is the mystery of godliness. Was Jesus Christ godly or was he God? See, the this mystery is the mystery of godliness. So let's read the whole verse. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That is not a description of, of Jesus Christ coming in the flesh, that's a description of God manifesting himself through the body of Christ. I'll give you one further proof of that. Do you see where it says, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory? If you want to say that that verse is about Jesus Christ being manifest in the flesh, then when Jesus Christ was manifest in the flesh, where was he received up into glory? It would have been right there at the ascension in, in Acts 1, right? Well, show me where he was preached unto the Gentiles before he was received up into glory. Was he? There's no verse where he was. What, what chapter did we study in Acts just a few moments ago? We didn't really study it. We talked about it. Acts 10. In Acts 10, Peter, the leader of the twelve, has to have a vision to even go to Gentiles, right? That's what Acts 10 tells you. So are you going to tell me that the Lord was preached unto Gentiles before Acts 1? He wasn't. What's going on in 1 Timothy 3.16, when it says great is the mystery, the hidden wisdom of godliness, is it is a reference to the church, the body of Christ. So let me say something more about this. We still haven't fully explained 1 Corinthians 2.8, where if Satan and his minions had known the mystery, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 
So think through this with me. What is it about the body of Christ that is so significant that if Satan had known it, he would have not been in favor of the cross? And I'm going to suggest to you here's what it is. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created, what's the rest of the verse? The heaven and the earth. The heaven and the earth. And so Genesis 1.1, in describing the cosmos, the universe, puts it into two categories, the heaven and the earth. So let's talk about the earth first. How is God ultimately going to govern the earth for all eternity? Who is he going to use? Israel, right? And the Old Testament is about God's formation of Israel. And when you think about the prophetic calendar in the future, it's about the Lord reigning in Jerusalem and then the new Jerusalem coming down and sitting on the new earth. The vast, vast majority of the scriptures is about how God is going to take back a rebellious earth under his desired government for all eternity. Let's put ourselves in Acts 7 just for a minute. If you're in Acts 7 and I were to say to you, explain to me what God is going to do to reconcile the heavens that are currently occupied by Satan and his minions. So let me just pause there for a minute. After Satan rebels in heaven, did God send all of the fallen angels to hell at that time? He didn't, did he? They were allowed to remain in heaven. They were allowed to remain in the positions that they were in. They're obviously rebellious. They're obviously not doing everything God wants them to do, but they are in those positions. What verse in Genesis to Malachi tells us what God is going to do to fix that problem? Right? Surely, is, is God going to allow the heavens for all eternity to be in a state of rebellion and wickedness and disorder? Obviously, he can't do that. That would be inconsistent with his character. But what verse explains between Genesis 1.1 and Malachi, even Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is there anything in there that solves that problem? There isn't. If you're right here, right before Acts 9, and you're Satan, what would you know about how God is going to attack the heavenly position that you hold. There's nothing there, is there? And in fact, when God creates angels in Genesis 1-1, excuse me, in Genesis 1, not 1-1, in Genesis 1 when God creates angels, what does God then do on the seventh day? He rests. Is there anywhere in Scripture where angels can create additional angels? No, there's not. Is there anywhere in Scripture where a fallen angel can obtain redemption and now be considered one of the elect angels? There's not that either. So what does that mean? Genesis 1, God creates a certain number of angels. After the end of Genesis 1, there's no verse that says God creates any new angels. So the amount of angels was a fixed number. The angels themselves cannot create new angels. Again, the number of angels is a fixed number. So when some of those angels fell and they were on Satan's team, there's nowhere in the scriptures where those angels can obtain a blood sacrifice and now be considered righteous. In other words, once they fell and they were considered wicked, they couldn't be redeemed. 
So right here, as Satan is thinking about what's going on in his conflict with God, Satan knows God has a plan to take back the earth. It involves Israel. Israel was promised the promised land. There's a kingdom that is going to be given to them. He understands all that, but there's nothing like that with regard to the heavens. So Satan might realistically think, God, there's, you don't even have a verse about what you're going to do to take back the heavens. And the angels, the leading ones, they're on my team. You haven't created any new ones. And you can't redeem them. So you know what? Maybe you get the earth. We'll fight about that. But the heavens, they're mine. Because the, you haven't provided redemption for these angels, and they're on my team, and I got the leading ones. So heaven, it's mine. Na 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 na. But what God does with the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile in one body, with what type of inheritance? What type of inheritance do you have in the body of Christ? Heavenly. Ephesians 1.3 says what? You're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That revelation is shocking, defeating, and embarrassing for Satan, isn't it? Because then what happened is the cross, yes, it purchased Israel's kingdom and Israel's blessings, but what it also purchased was the mystery that, that previously had been hidden. Satan didn't have any idea of it. So when God reveals to Paul and says, Paul, I'm giving you this mystery, I'm giving you this hidden wisdom, that what I'm going to do during the dispensation of grace is I'm going to form the body of Christ, and it is going to be a heavenly people that has a heavenly inheritance, it dawns upon Satan. So you're saying you don't have any use for me. You're saying that that which I currently occupy and control, I'm not going to. And the answer to that is yes. Right? Well, if Satan had known that, if he had realized that the cross was going to take away from him everything that he currently controlled in the heavens, he would have been against the cross. Look at me at Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2. So I have three pages of notes. We're almost uh, three quarters of the way through the first page. So we might not finish today. Look with me at Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Colossians 2, 15. And having spoiled, the idea of spoiled is, is they have been militarily defeated and plundered. All of the, their possessions have been taken. And having spoiled principalities and powers, that's not a reference to mankind. That's a reference to angelic principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In other words, here's what happens. Satan rebels back here. He rebels with his minions. And God allows them to continue to occupy their positions in heavenly places. And God does that because there are purposes that he, he is going to use Satan to accomplish. But Satan and his minions, they, they continue in those roles. And I suspect they're arrogant about that. I'm still in this role, God. If you get rid of me, there's nothing to put in my place. And nature abhors a vacuum, doesn't it? So you need me. Well, God doesn't need them, does he? Because he forms this replacement that was a mystery. Now, think about a different aspect of this just for a moment. 
The prophetic program is a demonstration of the power of God. Think of it this way. There's so many good examples of this. But I'll take one. There's a time in in Joshua where they're supposed to conquer a city. And what they do is they send them out with trumpets and torches. Not a sword, right? So they're sent out with trumpets and torches and the enemy goes into disarray and is defeated. Another example is David and Goliath, right? You're sending out much smaller David to fight Goliath. When, when Israel is about to go into the promised land, when the spies come back, what do the spies say? There's giants in the land. This is a bad, bad, bad decision. And what, what happens in all of those instances is from an earthly perspective, it looks like you're going to get crushed, right? Right? They're much bigger. They have these fortified cities. They have giants, etc. And, and what, the, what the prophetic program is, is it's a demonstration of God's power. Maybe here's a better way for me to say it. When God calls out Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he brings him into the promised land and says, you know, look around you as far as you can see. I'm going to give this all to you. God does that Satan is aware of it, and when Israel goes into Egypt for hundreds of years, what does Satan do? Well, Satan realizes, I know what he said to Abram, I know what his plan is, he's told me the plan. So, even though Abram is in Egypt for a while, God's going to try to bring him into the promised land. So, it's obvious what to do. I'm going to build up fortified cities in the promised land. There's going to be giants in the promised land. So when God in the future wants to bring Israel into the promised land, nope, it's mine, not going to happen. The prophecy program is a demonstration of God's power because here's what he does. He says to Satan, I'm going to do this and this and this. And I'll tell you right now, that's what I'm going to do. And you can prepare and scheme and do whatever you want. And I'm still going to do what I'm going to do. It's the equivalent of the quarterback goes up to the line of scrimmage, stares at the middle linebacker and says, I'm going to hand the ball to the tailback. We're going to run on the right side of the line. and We're going to run right between the center and the guard. That's what we're going to do. I'm telling you right now. So go ahead, shift your formation, put everyone right there. That's where we're going to go. And he wasn't lying. He wasn't bluffing. That's what I'm going to do, and you can't stop it. That's what the prophetic program is. The prophetic program says the Messiah will be from the tribe of Judah. He'll be born in Bethlehem. He'll be A, B, C, D, E, and Satan can't prevent it. Let me give you a further proof. In Genesis 3, God told the serpent that the serpent would be destroyed by what? The seed of the woman, right? So what does Satan do in response to that? Genesis 6, the sons of God, the angels, they come down and they try to corrupt the human seed line so that the seed of the woman that was prophesied can't be produced. How does Genesis 6 describe Noah? He was a just man and perfect in his what? Generations. Not his generation singular, not his age group, but his generations, plural. What was Noah's generations, plural? His descendants. So what happens with the flood, who get, how many males get on the ark? Four. And those four 
those four males are Noah and his three sons because Noah was perfect in his generations, plural. So the satanic attempt to corrupt the seed line so there could be no seed of the woman, what does God do? Well, if you, right before the flood, if you look at it, you're like, huh, well, Satan, uh, you've done a fairly effective job in corrupting the human seed line, but there's one problem. <laughs> I'm going to drown all your guys, <laughs> right? So that on the other side of the flood, 100% of the human seed line will be such that it hasn't been corrupted by Genesis 6. So I'm, al I'm almost done. The prophetic program is about God's power again. In other words, God says, I'm going to do A, B, and C, and Satan says, thank you for being honest and telling me, and now I'm going to prevent that, except what happens is every time he tries to prevent it, God's power is so great that God just overcomes it and does whatever he wants, right? So there's times where the Davidic seed line, which is what the Messiah is going to come from, is reduced to a small, small number of living descendants. But it doesn't matter because those living descendants are in the palms of God's hand, right? And they can't be destroyed without his awareness. Contrast the prophetic program, which is a declaration of power. I'm going to do this and you can't do anything about it. The mystery is not God openly saying, this is what I'm going to do. The mystery is, I'm going to conceal this wisdom, and I'm not going to tell you. Under the prophetic program, God would demonstrate that he was more powerful than Satan. Under the mystery program, God would demonstrate that he was, what adjective do I want? wiser than Satan. What I'm going to do, I'm going to keep one secret from you. And what you're going to do, because you don't have the wisdom I have, is you will unwittingly bring about your own destruction. Satan thinks the cross is, what a victory for me. Jesus Christ was humiliated, rejected, despised, put to death. What a victory for me. And the truth of it was, no. The Lord laid down his life knowing that he would not only purchase redeemed Israel, but he would purchase the body of Christ that would replace Satan and his minions in the heavens. And that is how he spoiled principalities and powers. And if he could do it again, he would not do that, but there's no do-overs. So the wisdom, the, the, the mystery program is God's demonstration that his wisdom is superior to Satan's. I have one final thought and I'll close. People often oppose right division and they will say, well, if right division were true, more people would believe it. Now, as a matter of argumentation, is that a logical argument? Is there anything about that that's valid? It's dumb, isn't it? Two plus two equals four, whether anyone agrees with it or not. If you take an opinion poll and everyone says two plus two equals five, it doesn't change the fact that two plus two equals four. So the fact that some people don't believe right division or the vast majority of humanity doesn't believe right division doesn't have any bearing on whether or not it's true. But what I want you to notice is this. What you will see play out on the earth is this. Satan is the god of this world. He is the father of lies. John 8, 4. Satan is the god of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. He is the father of lies, John 8, 44. He has set the course for this world, Ephesians 2, 2. And he was spoiled by the Lord Jesus Christ, Colossians 2, 15. So if you add all of those things together, how is Satan going to feel about the mystery? He will hate 
the mystery with a greater passion than he has hated anything because it is a humiliation of him. You thought you were so wise. You thought your plan was so clever. All I had to do was not tell you one detail and you destroyed yourself. Well, how do you think... Do you, do you recall we were reading Colossians 2.15? He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In other words, the highlight film of that is about Satan's destruction. So how do you think he feels about that? He hates that. And that's why dispensationalism is mocked and slandered and denied and disbelieved because the God of this world hates it. You know what that means? The information you've been entrusted with is the most valuable information on earth today. That's what we need to be stewards of. When 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1 says we are to be stewards of the mysteries, we need to be stewards of that information that God has clearly put in Scripture and wants us to know. Well, we didn't even get through page 1. So... That's where we are, but we, we, we do need to stop. So um, let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for this time. We thank you for the clarity of the scriptures. We thank you that you have revealed truth to us, that we, we know we couldn't understand it on our own and we would never be able to figure it out, but we rejoice that you have provided it to us. And we pray, Lord, that we would be daily searching the scriptures to get better understanding and that we would be more effective as the ambassadors you want us to be. We thank you for salvation as a free gift by Jesus Christ shed blood. We thank you that it's not of works and we thank you that we have eternal security. We pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's sing together. <laughs>